Welcome back to 1% Weekly. In this latest episode, I want to tell the truth about so-called income inequality, and I think I may ruffle a few feathers. Continuing in that theme, I'm going to return to my favourite topic of Jeremy Corbyn. This week, I'm going to talk about what a Corbyn victory might mean for you as an investor. And I also then want to meet Kevin Whelan again, our pensions expert, who's going to tell us about the training that we need in order to drive our financial Ferrari. There's been a lot of talk recently about income inequality. There's even a general feeling that it's getting worse when, in fact, the statistics for the UK suggest it's actually marginally improved in the last 10 years. But I want to go beyond that. I want to talk about historically and I want to talk about human nature because I've got some data that shows income inequality today is pretty much what it was in 1990, pretty much what it was in 1972, and pretty much what it was in 1938. In other words, some things don't change. And you know why that is? because human nature doesn't change. The technology might move on, the way we live might move on, but deep down inside, we still have the same basic ambitions, drives and characteristics. And what happens in any population of people is that a certain percentage of them are smarter than the others, they work harder than the others, they're more tenacious than the others when things go wrong, Hey, and guess what? They end up with more of the money. And it's happened since time immemorial. There is a pyramid of people who are hugely successful at the top, and then a pyramid of people who are good and you know, reasonably successful, and then there's the sort of average, and then there's the people who always seem to struggle. And those things tend not to change over years, decades, even centuries. So part of this, and obviously coming at this from the angle of the 1%, is I know how you got there. Now, a very small number get there through things like inheritance, because you've had lucky genes and your parents handed it all to you on a silver platter. Or maybe you married into it and then you got divorced with a huge settlement. But those are tiny numbers compared to the vast majority of people who are either self-made, first or second generation, running their own businesses, investing their profits, growing typically some sort of property portfolio, and then they're just handing that on sensibly to the next generation through proper tax planning, etc. And they create long-term wealth by working harder than most people, by being smarter than most people, by hanging in there when things get tough. A lot of people I know lost their businesses in the 2008 crash have they sat around licking their wounds? No, they've rebuilt the business and they're more successful than ever. Because what happens in these situations is a set of circumstances. It's not you, because what can't change in all this is what you've got between your ears. I'll give you another great example. When I was at school, we had a few lads joined us in the sixth form who were uh, Ugandan Asians. They'd been thrown out of Uganda by Idi Amin, who you might remember, a great big fat dictator. Now, what they did, they arrived literally with the clothes they stood up in and next to nothing. One of the guys that was in my class, when he arrived like that in the lower sixth form, by the time we left, what, 18, 20 months later, his father had already acquired a chain of newsagent tobacconist shops and was clawing his way back up to wealth because he still had it here between the ears. Armin took away everything else, but you can't take away this. And that's what causes these people, the cream if you like, to rise to the top. And most you know, people now, it's so non-politically correct to say that, we're trying to give equal opportunities to everybody. The bottom line is, whether you're Jeremy Corbyn or Fidel Castro, you have to come to terms with the fact everybody is not equal. Some are smarter, harder working, more tenacious, more successful than others. It's always been that way. It always will be that way. I can show you the data here going back to 1938. 
So let's not kid ourselves that there's some political problem or some economic problem going on here. All we're seeing is good old human nature repeating itself and cycling through again and again and again. So we've talked about the impact of a Corbyn government on business, but what about that impact on investors? Well, the chances are, if you're a member of Elite Investor Club or you're watching a program like 1% Weekly, I'm guessing that you're somewhat above average in terms of your net worth, your income, your assets, and so on. So what I'd like you to do now is get out a tin of paint and just paint a great big target on your chest because he's gonna be coming after you big time. We're going to have a higher rate of income tax for those that earn 80,000 a year plus. And by the way, there's already people paying 63%, I think it is, income tax. If you earn 120,000, there's a point at which you both pay the maximum tax and lose your personal allowances already. So you're paying a net rate of 60%. That's going to go up now, or it's going to come down the ladder to those on 80,000. They're going to get hit with that as well. I think there's going to be a wealth tax aimed at the middle class, particularly on property and investments, and they're going to try and raise three billion from that alone. So if you own assets, you know, we've heard about mansion tax and all this sort of stuff before, there's going to be some kind of tax on your overall assets. I think he's going to cut back the recent changes to the inheritance tax threshold. Um, that would come back to uh, 650,000 from a million for, for a couple. Um, and that would impact 24,000 families. I also think he's likely to increase capital gains tax because he's got a strategy to uh, reverse what he calls tax giveaways by conservative governments. So there's no doubt whatsoever that your personal tax burden will rise as a result of a Corbyn government. Um, he rather disingenuously says in his uh, conference speech, we'll ask you to pay a little bit more tax. A bit more tax. If you cost out his policies, you know, they look to me like, I would think, a trillion pounds worth. You know, he's talking about 250 billion just on his uh, uh, regeneration fund. He's talking about renationalizing all of the power and energy and the water companies and railway companies. If he buys them back at their full market value, that'll be hundreds of billions as well. Of course, he could do the sort of thing his mates in Venezuela do and just confiscate them on behalf of the state. So one of the questions you have to ask yourself is, what's in your portfolio that could fall victim to a Corbyn government? Do you own utility shares? Do you own transport companies? Do you own construction companies or land banking companies, all of which are very much in his sights? Remember what we said about undeveloped land being either taxed or confiscated, and all the new rules around regeneration mean that a lot of property developers and builders are, I think, going to really struggle to find viable projects. So, are you owning those uh, shares of those companies, either directly or in some of the funds and ETFs and things like that that you're invested into? So, I would take a look at your portfolio and see how Corbyn proof it is. Because you know, once you start going through all these things, these are huge sectors with loads of companies in that chances are, especially because a lot of these companies have been reliable dividend payers, you might well be invested in these and relying on those dividends for your future income and for your retirement. So you know, it's quite possible that some of your, your golden geese are going to be killed by a Corbyn government renationalizing those companies and simply taking them off the market completely. So it begs the question, you know, what should you consider? Should you go any further than simply making some minor adjustments to your portfolio? Well, one thing you might want to look at is simply owning assets outside the UK. Now, obviously, in these days of common reporting standards and so on, I'm not for one moment suggesting you're trying to do something that you would hide from the tax man. But certainly, uh, I met recently, for example, somebody who has both income and assets in three different countries on three different continents. And his plan is to effectively become a global citizen and spend three or four months a year in each of those places. 
And I can see that giving you lots of options going forward because you can have businesses there, you can optimize your tax arrangements, you can choose which country is most sensible to be tax resident in. Things like that I could see becoming a very smart strategy. Uh, you might want to transfer ownership of some of your assets to a company so that you're into a corporate tax environment rather than a personal tax environment because there's no doubt that personal taxes are going to get seriously hiked under Corbyn. Obviously, we have to suspect that corporate taxes will be raised as well, although to be competitive internationally, they couldn't be raised anywhere near as high as, 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 as personal income taxes at the moment. You may want to reduce the size of your estate, maybe start giving some gifts now. Uh, we've talked in the past about downsizing your property and giving the money to your kids today rather than risking a huge inheritance tax burden in the future. So have a think about whether it makes sense to start reducing your estate now. And of course the, the, the final kind of, I suppose, uh, a threshold in all this is you know, where is your enough is enough pain level? Is there a point at which you would simply say, I'm out of here? And if so, where would you go? Have you even asked yourself that question? I always say to people it should be in everyone's financial plan because you can just never tell where politics is going, where social unrest might arise if there was even more disputes about income inequality and all the rest of it. So, you know, it's worth having some kind of escape plan that you've at least given thought to. Where would you go? How would you transfer your wealth there? and how you know, quickly could you make that happen if some situation arose. So I'd urge you to think about that as a, as a possibility rather than a probability, but I think in terms of some of the other steps I've described, now is the time to take action, because quite frankly, you could see a Labour government at any point in 2018. Last week, we met pensions expert Kevin Whelan, who explained the benefits of director's pensions. Now, to get the keys to a financial Ferrari like this, it makes sense to have some driving lessons. So this week, Kevin's going to talk to us about the sort of training that's available for you as you set up your fantastic, powerful new scheme. So Kevin, last time we talked about the, the benefits of setting up a, a director's pension, um, but clearly, what you now have is a much more powerful uh, financial platform for doing all sorts of things for your investment life and also in your business life. Um, therefore, clearly, we need to give people some kind of guidance and training on, on how to do that. So um, I guess the, the main role that you take on when you become uh, you know, part of one of these directors' pensions is that of a trustee. And it is now, in fact, a legal requirement that you are trained as a trustee. So what are the sorts of things that, that you cover when you have a, a, a new client setting up one of these directors' pensions who wants to learn how to be an effective trustee? Yeah, that's a really good question. And of course, you're quite right that if it's a legal responsibility, with great opportunity comes great responsibility to get it right. Because the danger of getting it wrong is a tax charge and that tax charge could be severe. So we need to avoid that. But no one should be concerned because it's very easy to provide all the education, all the training and all the diligence that's needed to make that Ferrari work really well because that's, in the end of the day, what we need to get is a great performance but with safety. Mm -hmm. How we do that is address that in two, uh, two main ways. The first way is a level of training which we would call a core training which is really understanding what being a trustee is all about. Well, directors have already some knowledge about being a director of a company, so having a director's pension is just an extension of being a business owner. So as a director, you've got the responsibility to file tax returns. So you do as a trustee. So a, a director's pension is essentially a trust deed, a bank account, and a system of reporting. So you're taught how all of those things work mm. and then given the support to make sure that the operation of that is done very simply. Okay, and I think the, the um, 
the way you've done it is to structure a series of modules where people start out with what you might call that core training as to how to run the thing, but then as they want to get into other investment strategies, you have more training that's geared around how to, how to do that and then how to implement it in the actual director's plan. Exactly. You, you may recall from the, the last interview we had, Graham, I talked about the four Bs, you know, where people can buy and acquire assets, they can borrow money from their own account, they can lend money and work with, in collaboration with others, and they can access that money. So each of them form part of the training materials where there are videos, there are questions and tests that people will take to ensure that they feel confident in what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And of course, there's always the support of an external professional trustee who's keeping them safe and keeping them following the rules to make sure there's no danger ahead. And I think one of the things that, that I can't emphasize enough to, to, to any business owners watching is, is how rare uh, these schemes are in terms of how few business owners seem to know about them. In fact, I think you were telling me the other day that, that in the whole of 2017, just 4,000 schemes were registered by HMRC. And there are, what, how many businesses in this country? So you know, why do you think they are such a well-kept secret? Yeah, that's an interesting one. And I think there are a number of reasons for that. I think the first one is businesses naturally have a level of complexity and bandwidth, so their time to look at these things is limited. They more often than not have either had that dialogue with themselves about whether the pension is accessible, so they may not even have uh, diverted any of their profits into a trust for themselves, if you like, for their families for the future, which is a very interesting thought. Uh, it may well be that the advisors they've grown up with as their business has mushroomed and grown have really kept them into the stock market only solution and they may have pensions which reflect that and protected self-interest can sometimes get in the way. And finally, of course, when you talk about directors and their complexity and their bandwidth, they sometimes will make a decision that they think this is all a bit too complicated. Mm. When in fact, as I mentioned about the, the training and the support that's given, it's really not complicated at all, particularly as the director's pension is a logical extension of the current business they're in. Yeah. So they don't have to learn any more, just how they can use the money to a much better effect. And I think one of the things that bears uh, uh, emphasizing is that you know, even with the kind of reductions in lifetime allowances over the years, you could still, if you're a couple, you can put a million pounds each into a plan like this and shelter it from tax uh, pretty much for, forever until you start taking money out of that scheme. All the growth, all the borrowing, all the things we talked about the other day. Um, so, you know, this is a really powerful vehicle that, that really has to be part of what your, uh, uh, you know, your overall holistic plan um, and yet, uh, you know, you touched on something there. Is it a case that in many uh, uh, businesses they, they've, they've kept the same advisors for a number of years and they've never actually been told about things like this? Yes, I think if, uh, if the advisor has come from a traditional regulated place yeah. and pensions uh, historically are regulated by the FCA, so they regulate things in a certain way and the advisors all follow that regulation, a director's pension is not regulated in the same way. And because it isn't regulated in that way, then those advisors often simply do not know how to operate these things because they're not business owners themselves. Mm -hmm. So there can almost be a conflict of interest, I guess, between the knowledge of the old advisor and the knowledge that's needed. And bear in mind, of course, that putting aside the access and putting aside the, the huge opportunities for growth that exist to build up to that million pounds tax-free for as many directors or, or, or partners in the business that there are, there's an intergenerational tax planning tool because the trust is owned by the business owners themselves, then upon their death, there is a valuable additional trust fund that's created that basically moves from generation to generation. So an intergenerational tax planning tool, tax-free forever, no income tax, no capital gains tax, no inheritance tax. We must get this message out, Graeme. Exactly. And all of those benefits and only 4,000 people took advantage of it last year. It's crazy. Kevin Whelan, thanks very much. Thank you, Greg. We've just scratched the surface there of the amount of training that's available for you if you want to become the trustee and the driver of your own director's pension. If you'd like to learn more about that, just get in touch and we'll give you the full details. So as we come to the end of another episode, I just want to share with you something that's got my attention in this week's news. 
The workers at IG Metall, a great big metal bashing factory in Germany, have just won themselves an inflation beating 4.8% pay rise. But that's not all. They've also got the management to agree to a 28 hour working week. I mean, that makes France look mean with a mere 35 hour week. Can you imagine it? You know, Germany's got worse demographics than Japan. They've got a real aging population problem, millions of people dropping out of the workforce as they retire, and the ones that are left are only going to be working 28 hours a week. If there's much more of that, Germany will no longer be the powerhouse of Europe. I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.